Um, so again, welcome everyone um, to our talk tonight. Just um, a little housekeeping before we get into everything, just so you all know this um, talk is being recorded. So um, if you miss anything at any point, you'll be able to revisit later on our YouTube channel. Um, and please, um, if you have any questions during the presentation, just drop them in the chat below and we will read them out um, afterwards. Um, and so again, thank you all for being with us tonight. If this is your first time attending a program, welcome, welcome. Um, we are the National Collaborative for Women History Sites and we advocate for historic sites that center the preservation and interpretation of important of the important role of women and gender nonconforming individuals um, as the core to the American story. And we really just want to promote that work in these sites and make sure that it's being valued and well visited and well researched. Um, and so if you're not a member, please don't, you know, check out our website, look at the work we're doing. If you want to be a member um, and get access and find out about all the wonderful things we do, please um, check out our website for that information. Um, and then we will move into our conversation for tonight, which I'm so excited to introduce uh, Monet Lewis Timmons, who is going to talk to us about Alice Dunbar Nelson. And I'm just so excited. The archivist geek in me is just like so excited for our presentation tonight. And I really think fits the vision of what we're doing here at the Collaborative wonderfully. So Monet is actually a recent, very recent, so happy for her um, graduate, uh, PhD graduate of English PhD and African American Public Humanities Institute from the University of Delaware. She received her BA in English and African American Studies from Emory in Atlanta, Georgia. Her research highlights the archive of writer, educator, and activist Alice Dunbar Nelson to understand why and how Dunbar Nelson crafted her collection through her lifetime. Her work also recognizes the role descendants play in preserving and maintaining their ancestors' archives as seen through the labor of Dunmar Nelson's niece, Pauline A. Young, and scholarship produced by Asuka Gloria Ho. Through public humanities work, her research highlights the possibilities of Black women's archives by prioritizing the intentional practice to preserve and redefine themselves through material objects. Like I said in my archive part, just beating at that. Um, her dissertation included an in-person exhibition titled Alice Dunbar Nelson and the Legacy of Black Women Archives, which I suggest to anyone to put on your summer travel plans if you find yourself at the University of Delaware or anywhere near there in their special collections library and the exhibition I will get to hear Monet speak about um, will be on display until August 9th, 2024. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to let her get straight into her conversation with us tonight. And like I said, if you have any questions throughout or any issues, tec technically, please drop them in the chat and I will keep an eye on that. And with that, I'll hand it over to Monet. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you so much, Erica, for inviting me to be part of this special event. I am such a big fan of the work that y'all do and the way that y'all bring women together, that y'all bring women's stories together. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And so um, the title of this talk today is Curating the Dissertation, Alice Dunbar Nelson and the Legacy of Black Women's Archives, um, which is part of the exhibition title within itself. I really wanted to focus on the process of what it means to one, curate in general, but also what it meant as a grad student to have the opportunity and the flexibility to be able to create a series of scholarly essays, which I'll talk about, and also be able to curate an exhibition as part of my final dissertation project. Um, I, uh, I was housed in the English department at the University of Delaware. And so just having the ability to do something that's very interdisciplinary, um, that's very public facing was new for the department. And I'm just very grateful for the opportunity opportunity that I had um, and for people believing in me and trusting me to be able to do this work. And so during the Q&A um, portion, I will, you know, answer any additional questions folks have about that within itself. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So <clears throat> just for a brief outline of how today's talk is going to go, I'm going to introduce Alice Dunbar Nelson because 
I'm not sure, maybe y'all can put in the chat if y'all have heard of her name before, um, <clears throat> in what context, in, in what mode, have you read her poetry before, have you read her novels? Um, so you can put that in the chat and I'll, I can look at it in a second. Um, but who was Alice Dunbar Nelson, right? Then I want to get into the life cycle model, which um, kind of explains more about how I'm thinking about this cross-generational lineage of three different Black women across generations. And then I'll get into a brief outline of the dissertation chapters um, and how that connects in itself within the exhibition and some of the public events that I was able to do uh, with the exhibition. <clears throat> In a September 21st, 1928 diary entry, Alice Dunbar Nelson wrote, quote, put in most of the day at the office making up my diary. Seemed an awful thing to do just to spend that time, but my diary is going to be a valuable thing one of these days. While other 19th and 20th century Black woman writers' archives are often incomplete, fragmented, or destroyed, Alice's foreshadowing of her diary's impact reveals her awareness of the importance of documenting herself, not just for her present moment, but also for the future. Alice was a diarist, a novelist, an editor, scrapbook maker, and all of this work is preserved in the Alice Dunbar Nelson papers at the University of Delaware. But without the cross-generational archival care of other Black women, neither Alice's papers nor her literary reputation would have survived. My dissertation, which is titled, My Diary is Going to Be a Valuable Thing One of These Days, pulling exactly from this quote here, The Cross-Generational Lineage of Black Women's Archives, explores Alice Dunbar Nelson's motivation to document and record her daily lived experiences through the form of um, the accompanying exhibition, Alice Dunbar Nelson and the Legacy of Black Women's Archives. As Erica mentioned, the exhibition is on display in Morris Library Special Collections Gallery. Um, it opened February 6th and it closes August 9th. So as she said, if you can make some time, if you're in the Delaware area, please check it out. Um, a, a lot of this work and the exhibition itself is really focusing on the preservation efforts of Alice Dunbar Nelson's niece, Pauline A. Young, and scholarship on the diary produced from Dr. Akasha Gloria Hull. Tracing the lineage of the collection expands both literary studies to consider how writers archive contextualize their published works and private lives, while also shedding light on a Black feminist practice rooted in preservation and memory work across the 20th century. Born just a generation after enslavement on July 19th, 1875, Alice lived during a moment when being both black and woman came with both challenges and expectations. As she navigated citizenship, womanhood, her career and love, Alice was determined to build her legacy and resist erasure by capturing moments of her life. Alice Dunbar Nelson is often overshadowed by the work and legacy of her first husband, critically acclaimed poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. However, Alice's collecting practice throughout her lifetime reveals how she refuted this limiting identity of wife and, quote, widow of Paul Lawrence Dunbar by intentionally reinventing herself through her material objects. While the act of saving, keeping, and preserving was not an uncommon practice for individuals in the early 20th century, Alice's archive serves as a model for a specific tradition of Black feminist memory work and self-preservation as both an act of healing and resistance. I expand this framework and this thinking to really think about this cross-generational lineage of memory work to understand and connect with Alice Dunbar Nelson's experiences and her determination to document her life to make sense of how other Black women continued this practice. What makes Alice Dunbar Nelson's collecting practice so unique is that her archive presents an alternative narrative that highlights her private and personal self. Alice's papers encompass manuscripts, diaries, photos, letters, scrapbooks, and other material objects that reflect the interpersonal life of a complex and understudied figure. The collection complicates Alice's public reputation as it reveals her experiences with intimate partner violence and police brutality, challenges she faced with publishing her work, her struggles with her mental health, and her romantic relationships with other women. 
I argue that the emotional, physical, and spiritual labor in building one's archive is a radical practice for Black women writers. What did it mean for Alice Dunbar Nelson to deliberately document and define herself through these materials? And what can Black women's collecting and record-keeping practices tell us about how they want to be remembered? My dissertation answers these, or answers these questions by emphasizing issues pertaining to Black women's archives, such as how women documented their public and private selves, how we can read the archive as a form of autobiography, and how Alice Dunbar Nelson's archive and collecting practices influence her niece Pauline's preservation practices and later Dr. Hull's literary scholarship. The cross-generational lineage of Alice's archive answers these above, above questions within several fields, such as Black women's studies, literary studies, and archival studies to expand our understanding of Black women across the 20th century. So I'm really placing a lot of this work, um, both the dissertation itself and the exhibition, uh, which follows a similar format, um, in conversation with what uh, scholar Jean Christophe Cloutier is calling the life cycle model. Um, and so both the exhibit and the essays call attention to these women's collecting practices, the hidden labor of Black woman descendants, and the role of the scholar um, in recovering another Black woman's life. And what makes the life cycle model so interesting is that it encourages us to view the archive as alive and active right? Obviously, there's the word life <laughs> in this phrase within itself, but as you see, it is following the slick cyclical model as a never-ending, right? So thinking about how um, this model goes into different, into different phases such as creation, capture, storage and maintenance, use, and disposal. Um, and what makes Alice's and Pauline's preservation practices so significant is that by caring for these materials, they were able to assert their own assessment of the archive's value. And this is something I can talk about more in the Q&A, um, but just right understanding what does it mean for Black women to be so intentional about keeping and maintaining an archive and then um, selling it to an institution. Uh, what does that look like for when we're thinking about how Black people, especially Black women, the ways that archives are created to leave them out, to erase them, um, and these women being like, actually, no, there's, act there's so much value in these papers, both for the present moment and for the future. And so, Going back to this cross-generational lineage, um, my research prioritizes the role of the archival creator, in this case being Alice Dunbar Nelson, and taking seriously Black women's curation and documentation of themselves as an act of self-preservation. And so here on the left, this is a photo of Alice Dunbar Nelson towards the end of her life. Um, in the middle, we have her niece, Pauline A. Young, who grew up um, in the same household as Alice. Alice and uh, her sister, Leela, actually raised Pauline and her siblings, um, and they were just a very close-knit family. Uh, and I think a lot of the work that Alice was doing influenced Pauline's trajectory as a historian and as a scholar within her own right. And then looking at um, the scholar, Dr. Akasha Hull, and a lot of the recovery work that she was doing, um, more specifically during the 1970s and 1980s, to revive and think about the complexities of a woman like Alice Dunbar Nelson. And so both the dissertation itself and the exhibition are kind of following uh, these three different women. So there's a section for Alice Dunbar Nelson, there's a section for Paulina Young, and there is a section for Akasha Hull. And it's really thinking about the role that all of these women play in one collection in a way. Um, and so the first part, Alice Dunbar Nelson, creator of the archive, I highlight Alice's correspondence, her scrapbooks and her diaries to reveal the vastness of the collection and her intention to record her life. Um, I think one of the really great things that I noticed when first engaging with Alice's archive during my first year of graduate school was just being so surprised by how much stuff there was. I was like, there are so many letters, there's so many scrapbooks, right? And I'm thinking, okay, if she was born in 1875 in Louisiana, she migrated um, to Washington, D.C., to New York. She moved around a lot. And for her to still be able to keep all these materials 
was so fascinating for me, um, especially during this time in my classes, I was reading a lot of methodology and scholarship on uh, the erasure of Black women in archives, specifically enslaved Black women and how they were erased. And so having this one collection that was very vast and then also learning about um, the theory, um, I'm thinking of Cydia Hartman, Marissa Fuentes, right? Thinking of these scholars who are looking at the absence of Black women, it was really interesting to put the idea of Black women in the archive in conversation with each other based on who was building their archive and maybe who didn't have the opportunity to build their archive, but we still see traces of them in history. And so I think that's what really made me run with this um, with this project and made me delve uh, deeper and further into the research within itself. Um, and a lot of this is also just thinking about how Alice Dunbar Nelson navigated respectability politics during this time. And so, as I mentioned earlier, her collection really reflects her private um, thoughts and her private life. Um, and that comes with pain and it comes with trauma. Um, uh, but for her to keep this and for her to know, okay, my diary is going to be a valuable thing one of these days, I think she really wanted to make sure that future generations knew about her life um, and what it meant for her to be a Black woman navigating the early 20th century. And so these are just a few materials that are both featured um, in the written dissertation itself and the exhibition. Um, here on the far left, this is actually a letter from Edwina B. Cruz, um, who was the principal of Howard High School in Wilmington, Delaware. And Howard High was the only Black um, high school for children in the entire state at the end of the 19th century. And Edwina B. Cruz was the principal there, and she actually hired Alice Dunbar Nelson to chair the English department. Um, but the two of them also had a romantic relationship as well as a working relationship. And so this letter in particular from Edwina Cruz, um, you know, she's really giving Alice these updates of, oh, this is what's going on at the school. This is what's going on um, within the family household. And then also ending her letters with love, with care, with encouragement, um, because at this time, Alice Dunbar Nelson had actually took a sabbatical to obtain her master's degree at Cornell University. Um, so I really find those letters interesting and just the care that, I mean, I know this is a scan, but it's in still pretty good condition. Um, so I'm thinking that she really cared for these materials. And then also just showing, um, Alice Dunbar Nelson as the as a writer. A lot of people know her for her poetry and her short stories, but she was also an editor and she was a journalist and she had columns uh, in different newspapers. And so she wrote for the AME Church Review often. Um, here we see um, she loved attending musicals. <laughs> she stayed at an opera house, right? Um, and then here seeing some of her scrapbooks, particularly around her woman's suffrage movement uh, in the 1910s and 1915. And so really just showing the range of her collection, but also thinking about for her, what were the most important materials that reflected how multifaceted she was as a figure. And the second part of um, the exhibition and the dissertation is looking at Pauline Young, keeper of the archive. And so a lot of this section is really thinking about Pauline Young's um, attention and determination to find an archival home for her Aunt Alice's papers. And so after Alice died in 1935, she actually wrote in her will to uh, leave her books and her papers to her niece Pauline Young, trusting her with the response with the responsibility, excuse me, of publishing her uh, manuscripts as well as just caring for her papers in general. And um, Pauline Young spent the 1970s to 1984 writing different repositories, um, which we see here in this, um, in this uh, sheet right here, she has a list of institutions to reach out to. Um, these are, I think, just a few of the institutions that she wrote telling them, hi, you know, I have Alice Dunbar Nelson's paper. She was the wife of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Uh, you know, I'm looking to sell these papers to your institution. And oftentimes, um, she was met with letters of rejection. Um, I know in particular, the University of Chicago said, oh, there's no interest in Black studies here. No one will be interested in these papers. 
um, which is significant when we're thinking about the 1970s and the 1980s as this era and period where there's the development of Black studies and um, African American studies programs across the country at different institutions. So what does it mean to kind of catch these places at these particular times and moments? Um, this middle letter here is actually um, once she sold the collection to the University of Delaware uh, back in 1984, just confirming, <laughs> you know, that she would be paid and she was very adamant about being paid for the collection. Um, and then here we have a newspaper clipping um, from the University of Delaware Press once the library is um, acquired and just really the excitement that was happening around having black papers at an institution such as the University of Delaware. And then the third section is called Akasha Gloria Hull, Scholar of the Archive. And um, this actually looks a lot at Dr. Hull's recovery work. And so during the 1970s and 1980s, um, she actually taught English at the University of Delaware. And she was teaching Paul Lawrence Dunbar, ironically, when a student came up to her and was like, oh yeah, like the Dunbar niece doesn't live too far from here. Um, and, you know, Dr. Hull was like, what? Like, you know, who is this woman? And so <clears throat> Dr. Hull actually ended up cultivating a relationship with Pauline Young. Um, Pauline Young would invite her to her cottage. She would allow her to look at the papers um, and all their filing cabinets. She would look at the letters and they really just formed um, this really beautiful relationship that um, allowed Dr. Hull to be able to learn from Pauline Young to kind of fill these historical gaps, right? As historians, as archivists, we kind of want to know, okay, what's missing from here? What am I not seeing? And Pauline Young uh, was the glue and the key to do that. Um, and so wh while looking at the letters, uh, Dr. Hull came across some diary entries and um, she found out about Alice Dunbar Nelson's relationships with women. And when she brought it up to Pauline Young, um, you know, Pauline Young denied um, that her aunt had same sex desires. And, um, you know, she was a, a little bit frustrated about it. And she was like, oh, well, I don't want that published in the diary because that's revealing our family secrets. And Dr. Hull, um, just being a Black feminist scholar within herself, thinking about the wholeness and telling all parts of Black women's lives, you know, she kind of had to talk to Pauline Young and really convince her that, you know, this doesn't tarnish her name, it doesn't tarnish the family reputation, it doesn't tarnish her literary works, it's telling the whole story, it's allowing people to see her how she wanted to be seen, as seen through her collecting practice. And so... Dr. Hull ended up publishing Give Us Each Day, The Diary of Alice Dunbar Nelson. Um, and, you know, it was fine until reviews came out and some of the reviews were focusing on Alice Dunbar Nelson's sexuality and not even in a demeaning way, but really being surprised and also celebratory of the fact that, you know, this information was coming out and starting to have these conversations about what it meant to be a queer Black woman during the early 20th century. And so unfortunately, um, conversations uh, ended between Dr. Hole and Pauline Young, um, which is something I can talk about more in the Q&A, just in terms of what is the role of the scholar when uncovering or when telling parts of a figure's life that we consider hidden or that may not be as widely known. Um, and she, Dr. Hull ended up fleshing out these ideas of Black woman sexuality in later works. And so she published Color, Sex, and Poetry shortly after the diaries. And then she also um, participated in the Schomburg uh, 19th century Black woman writers literary series um, and did a whole edited volume on Alice Dunbar Nelson's work. And so I really consider her as a key component um, of this generational lineage because without her scholarship, we wouldn't really have these complex or know these private things about Alice Dunbar Nelson in a way that is pushing Black women's studies, Black women's history, um, and just archival studies in general. And so to the exhibition part. <laughs> As Erica mentioned, um, the exhibition is on view until August 9, 2024. It's titled Alice Dunbar Nelson and the Legacy of Black Women's Archives. And um, these are just a few um, photos from the exhibition itself. It's located um, at UD's Morris Library in the Special Collections Gallery. And um, yeah, this was just a very fun <laughs> 
project. It was a lot of work, um, especially when considering also writing the dissertation itself. But I think that it allowed me to write the dissertation in a more cohesive way and also considering a public audience. Um, and so these are just a few cases. This is one of the introduction uh, panels and texts that is really welcoming visitors um, to the space, as well as having a few of Alice Dunbar Nelson's scrapbooks on display, as well as some ephemera and pamphlets um, that she decided to keep during her lifetime. And then also more contemporary scholarship that um, has recently been published on Alice Dunbar Nelson and really fleshing out who she was as a person. And so, um, yeah, we used um, over a hundred items uh, for this exhibition. I got to work very closely with Dr. Curtis Small, who was great. Um, and he provided me with so much mentorship and guidance and just what it means to curate and all the things you have to consider, um, lighting, text, font size, all of that, right? Um, sometimes we don't really think about that when we're sitting at our desk and we're just, you know, writing these papers. Um, but how does that translate to a more public audience? Um, I also just wanted to briefly mention too that this was a very collaborative project as well. So it wasn't just myself and folks um, in special collections at the University of Delaware, but I also had the opportunity to work with um, librarians, archivists, um, digitization archivists at the Atlanta University Center Robert Woodruff Library in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, the AUC Woodruff Library is the home um, for Spelman College, Morehouse College, Clark Atlanta College. This is the library for all of those institutions and in HBCUs. And so I got to work with um, Tiffany Atwater Lee and Martina Dodd very closely, um, who helped me select materials to use and produce facsimiles of the materials to use uh, for the exhibition itself. And so it was just really cool being able to put two institutions um, in conversation with each other, especially when we're thinking about um, PWIs and HBCUs and Black collections at both of those places and how these repositories acquire these collections, um, I think is really interesting. Um, so I can talk about that more later, um, but I'm very grateful to the AUC uh, Woodruff Library as well as the Schomburg Center um, who has Akasha Gloria Hull's papers. Um, and so just to kind of uh, wrap up the presentation portion of this, I did want to briefly touch on just two public events that I was able to uh, do as part of the exhibition itself. Um, even though I was in an English department and um, that was my main area of focus, I really wanted to do something that was public facing that folks could interact with. Um, I wanted to create community and conversation. And so the first um, event I did was in person at the University of Delaware. And um, this was a co another collaborative um, effort between myself and folks from the Howard High Alumni Association. So as I mentioned earlier, Howard High is where um, Alice Dunbar Nelson taught for nearly two decades. Pauline Young also taught there. Um, and Pauline Young actually gifted a lot of her papers to uh, the Howard High. And so the Howard High Alumni Association has been responsible with um, caring for those papers. And uh, back in January last year, um, myself and other graduate students got to process those papers and create a finding aid, right? And so really thinking about how, you know, this history, these women's lives, their papers aren't just affecting the academics, right? This is everyone, everyone who's living in Wilmington, Delaware, everyone who feels connected to this history. And so it was just a really great um, event. They got to share what the collection means to them. Um, and yeah, I just really enjoyed this event. It was, it was, um, it was really nice to be able to do this. And then the second event that I did was a virtual, uh, symposium where I actually <laughs> got to speak with Dr. Akasha Hull, um, who's been very encouraging and just supportive of this work. So I'm also grateful to her. And, um, it was a virtual symposium with, uh, Dr. Hull as a keynote speaker and with remarks from Dr. Tara T. Green, um, who wrote one of the first full length biographies on Alice Dunbar Nelson and Dr. Jesse R. Erickson, uh, who was my mentor when he was at the University of Delaware. And he's also just been very supportive of this work. Um, so I can go ahead and wrap up there. Um, I know that was a lot of information, 
But thank you all so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to being in conversation with you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so as we await, um, please feel free if you have any questions to throw, put them in the chat. Um, you can also just direct message them. Um, I'm going to kick off with a personal just, I mean, I love how you talk about the life cycle of archives. And I think it's something we don't think about, especially when it comes to historic sites, how much these materials play a role in how we tell stories. But it's that life cycle of how these papers end up where they end up that plays such an integral role in knowing what we know in order to tell the stories we need to tell is such an interesting fact. And I really am drawn to the what you said about the idea about how you looked at your um, work as kind of that thoroughfare, that kind of starting with the person who created it, but then the, you know, the person now who advocates for getting that collection somewhere to make sure that they're not hidden, especially as we know, Black women's archives are really just so difficult to navigate because of how they've been preserved. Um, but also then the scholarship, the ongoing scholarship, and I just want to say you are now a part of that life cycle with the work you did and your exhibition. So please don't ever lose sight of that. You are now a part of that life cycle, which I think is just really incredible. Um, and so we have some questions coming in. So I'm excited for that. So um, first question we're going to get to is, um, as an English major, was it her work with poetry that first drew you to um, Alice Demmer? work um what what was it that drew you I guess to that collection yeah that's a great question um when I was an undergrad at Emory um if folks are familiar Emory has the Rose Library and I actually started doing archival research there as an undergrad working with the Alice Walker papers and so I don't know I could I've I've kind of just always been interested in like stuff <laughs> maybe part of it is that I'm a little nosy you know but uh, <laughs> you know just kind of being interested in all of these things um and so I kind of came into graduate school with you know you know when folks are asking you your elevator pitch oh what's your research on or you know I was like oh black women's archives black women's archives and everyone immediately was like oh you got to check out the Alice Dunbar Nelson papers <laughs> you have to check out the Alice Dunbar Nelson and I was like okay like I hadn't really heard of her you know before then and so it actually wasn't, um, to answer the question, it wasn't her literature or her poetry that brought me to the collection. Um, it was actually her letters with Edwina Cruz. And um, shout out to Jesse Erickson, who told me about those letters. He was like, oh, you got to see these letters. And I was like, oh, OK. And I was just very fascinated um, with these women's relationships, right? Um, I had never seen like that. I mean, 20th century, you know, it's not like that long ago, but just seeing this early model of a Black woman's intimate relationship um, was just very fascinating to me. And so the collection actually doesn't include any of Alice's responses to Edwina, but based on how Edwina was writing to her, um, I just loved all of the care and support that she was giving her. Um, and then the times where, you know, there's a little gossip and tea too, but- um, oh, The gossip's I, always the best part of it. Yeah, not. the gossip is always the best part. Like they're talking about people at the schools a lot, but um, I just really loved like this, this letter writing form. And um, yeah, that kind of just led me to other materials within the collection. Wonderful. And now a great question that I'm always like, as an archivist, I'm always, I should I should have asked this question too, is um, how large is the collection that's at the University of Delaware? Yeah, I saw that question in the chat. I was like, let me get the exact number. <laughs> first. I was over here typing, but it's um 7.8 linear feet, uh, okay. which is about 2,568 items. Wow. Yeah, and so part of that collection also includes some materials from her sister, Mary Leela, um, she also has materials on Paul Lawrence Stumbar as well. So yeah, it's very vast um, in number, but also in like material, diverse in material too. Amazing. And I love that you brought up the fact that the diversity of the collection, because I feel like a lot of times we kind of get lost in like archives is only paper or archives right. is only this. And it's like, no, it can encompass so much more and really be, I, I also like how you called, talk, called it kind of like an autobiography. Yeah. in a way and I hope you don't mind I'm going to give you credit but I'm definitely going to do that <laughs> in my work because it really is such a really great way of thinking about the agency 
mm-hmm. that these women had in curating what they did leave behind. And I think that's a really, um, I love that fact that you brought that up. And it's something that I think the collaborative definitely endorses when it comes to the work that's done in historic science mm-hmm. agency back mm-hmm. to people in whatever way um, that that can be done. Um, another question that was in the chat um, was, what was the impetus for the sale of the papers instead of donating slash gifting the collection? Yeah, so I feel like I didn't find out the truth about this until recently. <laughs> um, I always had the speculation. I was like, oh, you know, Pauline Young. Um, so she passed away 1991. She was born the year 1900. And, you know, this was kind of towards the end of her life. And so I was thinking, okay, maybe she, before she transitions, she wants to find a home for these papers. Um, She wants her aunt's work and name to get out there. Um, She's also considering her own labor in protecting the collection for so long. And so I was also like, I think that's a part of why she wants to sell these papers. Um, Another reason also being that 1972, she actually donated a few of the letters between Paul and Alice to the Ohio Historical Society. And then she found out that they were making copies of it and selling it. And she was like, wait, how am I not getting any cut of this? It became a whole legal exchange um and I think that's when she realized you know these institutions will take over these papers if I let them and (laughs) at least compensate me if I am handing them over right and so I think she was very scarred um from that specific experience with um the Ohio Historical Society because she felt like she got played um to put it more simply um and then in the slide that I showed with the folks from the Howard High Alumni Association the woman in the picture Miss Sandra Wright was actually Pauline Young's um uh like goddaughter and so she like as a kid she would go to Miss Pauline's house they lived in the same neighborhood And she was telling me towards the end of Pauline's life as well, um, she was struggling financially. And I think that that says a lot about what it means for our Black women elders, our Black women scholars, our Black women historians. They do all of this work throughout their lifetime. And often towards the end of their lives, um, they're not left with much, um, especially like the monetary value to reflect their work. And so I think that's also why she was very adamant about um, receiving financial compensation. Now, that's such an interesting point, because we do, like, I think a lot of people also forget how did these materials end up in these collections. And I think about, um, there was the activist Richard T. Greener, also around early this time period, um, who, when he had papers that were found in a wall, in Chicago in the early 2000s. And there was a lot of the man who found him was a construction worker who was also had, you know, an African American gentleman just doing, you know, hard labor was low on finances. And Harvard tried to screw him out of his money for those materials. And it was a it was a similar situation where he was just trying to make sure that the materials but also understanding his role again in the history of these documents and so it always gets to be a very hard and uncomfortable conversation but I think it's an important one to how we get these materials where they end up so thank you so much for shedding light on that and great question and then we had another really good question that um let me just scroll back up um how does this statement about Alice's diary being a way to tell about her private life compared to Alice and her sister destroying their diaries throughout their life Mm, Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm happy that um, whoever asked that question, thank you. Because there is a part where, you know, I'm like, wow, this is a lot of stuff in the collection. And also there's probably so much more that we'll never, ever, ever see. And so, yeah, there are instances um, where Mary Leela, um, Alice's sister, um, and this is in the exhibition itself, she opens up, I think it's her 1901 diary on January 1st. And she's like, you know, maybe I'll keep this one. You know, I'm not going to destroy this diary like the rest. And I was like, oh, they knew what they were doing, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is very common, um, I think, for a lot of women of that time, especially a lot of Black women, is that navigation, right, of how much am I willing to share with the public? How much do I want people to really know about me, right? And I think that um, this also comes up in a short story that Alice writes. Um, It's Confessions of a Lazy Woman, and the uh, protagonist destroys her diaries too. It's like she burns them. And they had apparently had these rituals where they burned their diaries. Mm-hmm. And so I think that knowing what we have 
in the collection now and then knowing what was possibly destroyed, I think reinforces even more the fact that um, she was intentional about her her practice. Like she was like, okay, I'll keep this, but maybe I won't keep this. I'll share this, but maybe I won't share that. And I think it just goes back to how she was really ahead of her time in foreshadowing how she wanted to be remembered, how she wanted to be viewed, um, even if she you know, wasn't going to be here to tell that story herself. So again, with the agency of these women, I always think that in the papers I recently processed um, at the Morgan where I get to work with Jesse. Um, So shout out again to Jesse. Um, But with with the papers about LaCosta Green, she also burned her diaries, but Mm -hmm. kept all of her professional papers because she wanted to be remembered as a librarian. So I think it really is an interesting kind of lineage of kind of the destruction, but also what was saved and what those stories and what that narrative tells us um, Mm -hmm. really is such an interesting conversation that um, you only get through actually getting to work with these papers and realizing what is there um, and kind of reading sometimes between the lines of those things to also tell these stories. Um, mm-hmm. Another um, great question that came in, but um, also congratulations, your work is so creative. Um, you're Thanks. a fourth generation of archivists in this wonderful collection. Um, and what kinds of documents university and what kinds did she keep for her own collection? Um, and mm-hmm. then follow up, who was Alice's second husband? Oh yeah. Okay. I'll start with the last question. So Alice actually was married three times. <laughs> Her second husband was Henry Arthur Callis. Um, if you're familiar with Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, he was one of the seven jewels, the founders. Their relationship was very secretive though, because he was younger than her. And at that time it was very taboo for the woman to be older than the man in a relationship. So they weren't married that long and they actually ended up being friends um, for the rest of their lives, even after their divorce. And then her third husband was a man by the name of Robert J. Nelson, uh, who was a journalist. And so they actually had a joint, uh, they were both co-editors of the Wilmington Advocate, uh, which was um, a newspaper that they started together. Um, And they were still married when she passed away as well. Um, To answer the first question, what kinds of documents did Pauline sell to the university? Um, Yeah, a lot of the documents that she sold were the scrapbooks, the manuscripts, um, photographs, um, ephemera. There's baby booties in the collection. There's just like a lot of like random stuff. Um, And then there's also a Pauline Young collection at the University of Delaware as well. So as of now, I know of three different locations of Pauline's papers, UD, um, the AUC Woodruff Library, which a lot of those materials are actually centered on Alice and Paul. And that's where I found the letters of where she was corresponding with the different institutions to sell the papers. And then she also has materials um, at Howard High School. And those materials really encompass um, yearbooks, um, a lot of yearbooks from the school, right? So she was all the pockets of where she has her papers that she's kind of memorializing the space that they're in in a way um but a lot of the materials there are um materials related to Howard High's history and then she also this was the part I was working on when we were processing it there are so many newspaper clippings (laughs) and she had a system a very unique system like she read a lot she was always she always had a newspaper and she would clip anything related to black people and she had a system where she wrote black history black music Uh black art black so we honored that in processing the collection like okay we're just gonna stick with the same love it (laughs) system you know um but yeah she has um her papers are located at those three different places i also consider her as someone who was intentional about her archiving practice in a way that she was very keen on preserving Black history. And so all of the collections that I've seen of her papers um, don't really contain as much like private and personal information as Alice's, which I think is really interesting, um, just considering the generation she grew up in. Um, she wanted to present herself as an educator. So we don't really see the relationships that the private relationships that she's having with folks or, you know, um, any intimate moments in that way. And I think I can consider her what, like you were saying earlier, Erica, as, you know, one of those figures who was destroying (laughs) maybe some of those materials that revealed more of her private life, so. 
I know I always get so mad when I realize like something's not there. And I'm like, I know it was there. I know you yeah. worked on it, but hey, we yeah. have to respect what they didn't want it. us to know. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I always say, don't be afraid of those silences. Don't, you know, yeah. I we can be upset, wish we knew things, but it's also about honoring those kind of decisions, especially when it comes to women, history, and, you know, understanding the world they live in, and especially at different times, you know, sometimes it's what was what was best for them yeah, in order exactly. to protect um, their families and those around them. So this is really just um, great. If anybody has any final questions as we begin to wrap up here, um, and please, yes, if you find yourself in the Delaware area, I mean, I'm going to try my best to get down there myself. Um, I'm really excited about the work you did there. Thank you so much for yeah. spending this time with us. Um, thank you everybody else for spending so much time with us. Um, and just quick shout out if you were interested in the work that uh, Dr. Lewis Timmons is doing, <laughs> had to get that in there now with your new title. Um, and if you're interested in the work of Alice Merlin, then please also remember that she is a part of, of our um, Suffers Trail. Definitely check that out. And also um, my work um, at the Morgan Library and Museum, we have an exhibition opening in October, on October 25th. Um, on Belle da Costa Green, who was the Morgan's first director, and her archive was the basis of our exhibition as well. And we, me and Monet, have already been like, there are so many connections with the, not just between these two women, but in how their archives were kept, in the purpose of their archive work. Um, and so if you're, you know, go to Delaware this summer, come on up to New York City um, in the fall and just complete your women in the archives journey. Um, that way with us. So thank you again for joining us, everyone. And thank you again, Monet, for your wonderful presentation and your amazing work that you did in highlighting um, just Alice's work and who she was and also the life cycle of archives and how important it is that we preserve these materials and we keep telling the stories and they don't just sit in a room where nobody pays attention to them. Because like you said, they're alive and breathing. So just thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a good night.